stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here in the Hollywood Museum in the historic Max Factor building on Highland Avenue in the heart of Hollywood. And our guests are director Kiff Scholl and writer Paul Link. Award-winning actor, director, filmmaker, Kiff Scholl was born in Northern California and graduated from high school and college in Central New York. He's directed dozens of plays, acted in commercials, TV, and film, and is a voiceover specialist now, as well as a filmmaker for which he's won many awards. I know. A few, for a, sure. A few, <laughs> especially um, these really bizarre titles like Scream of the Bikini, which is probably um, the right time right now to talk about Siamese sex show. Awesome. <laughs> right? And what about that other bizarre title? Uh, Medicare Mermaids. Yeah. How did you come up with all of these things? <laughs> <laughs> I've only, I have only came up with one of those titles. Si uh, oh. <laughs> Siamese sex show is not my title, although I love it. Uh, Scream of the Bikini was my title. And that turned into what? Uh, that was a feature film, my first feature, um, and it was a, a period piece. We shot it so that people thought it was made in the 60s. Ah, uh, and it was and on HBO? Was it on HBO? It wasn't on HBO, it's on Amazon. Oh, it's on Amazon. And, uh, and I did win a Best Director um, movie, um, Maverick Movie Award for that. Maverick. Yes. Because did this Maverick stuff come from when you were in Denmark? Because you were there for a while, right? I spent a year in Denmark as a, as a high school student. Oh, is that when it uh, yeah, was? Yeah, yeah. I learned fluent Danish, which was a bizarre skill to acquire in, at age 16. Can you uh, still speak? Yes, snaga steady fluent dansk. Um, wow, that was a great thing. Was that from New <laughs> yeah. York? Was that from high school in? Uh... Yeah, I kind of. I actually hated high school. I just. I was. I was. You know, a weirdo. I was an artist. <laughs> you were a weirdo. And I was not welcomed, and so I said, "Get me out of here." And uh, the exchange program seemed like a great, great way out. So I ended up in Denmark as a. For Luck a of year. the draw for, for a year. For a year. Yeah. And I just fell in love with it. Amazing country. And now the, all these great filmmakers are coming out of there. So it kind of was a blessing in disguise. So you were like this exchange student. Yeah. And I think the influence was like something rotten is happening in Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, if I can't be Hamlet, I can go where he's from. <laughs> <laughs> so, was there any kind of show business in your family? My parents met doing theater. Oh, so this is a, in the background. Uh, it was inevitable. I couldn't avoid it if I wanted to. But you weren't right in New York City. You were up no, north, right? I did go to NYU uh, oh, you right did? before I came to LA, but uh, for the most part, no, yeah, I'm really an upstate guy. And what were they doing? My parents. My mom was a director oh. and also an actress. Um, and my and she cast my dad in I think oh gosh I forget whether I think it was the sign in Sydney Bloomfield's window is the name of oh, the play oh yeah it was I classic remember classic old play right yeah yeah but she was also sixties yeah yeah, yeah something like that I, I made it I may be wrong my mom's gonna see this and say no no that's okay <laughs> these are our remembrances right exactly so they're they're just as valid and you can ride in any way yeah you exactly want. right and then my mom and my stepfather met. Um, when she directed a uh, witness for the prosecution, he staged managed his first and only play and, and wow. they fell in love. Where so was that? That was uh, Ithaca, New York. Oh, it was in Ithaca. I think Is it that was where the you Hanger were from? Theater. I you grew up there? in Ithaca, yeah. Was Beautiful. there a lot of theater? Yeah, yeah. Well, Cornell University is there. Oh, right. Ithaca College is there. Right. Really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Culturally diverse, oh. very artistic community. I never thought about that. Where do yeah. you fly to go to Ithaca? Ithaca, Ithaca, you can fly into Ithaca, but Syracuse, oh, Syracuse. Rochester, I see. yeah, it's, it's a little central bigger, New York. A little, ah, 
I see. So when you came back from being an exchange student, were you finished with high school then? I, yeah, I graduated in Denmark, so I didn't, oh, you to, did? I, I didn't get to walk with my class, unfortunately. You're kidding. And did you stay longer than the rest of the exchange students? Uh, it was, I stayed 365 days. So you stayed a whole year, Exactly. Right? I, I arrived on July 9th, and I left on July 9th. July wow. 9th is now my Danish holiday. Were there any other students with you? Yeah, oh gosh, probably... 300 or so. Oh, but not all from your school. No, from no, no. all over the U.S.? I was the only one from my school. I see. They were from all over the country, all over the world, so Australia. Just, and then you, you went to college. Yep. Co um, I went to SUNY New Paltz first. And New then I, Paltz? New is that Paltz, how you say yes. It? Right outside Woodstock. New Paltz. I yeah. thought it was New yeah. Paltz. New There's Paltz. so many Sonys. They're like Cal <laughs> yeah. States, right? Right, right, yeah. exactly. So... Did you start writing then? I did. I did, actually. Uh, yeah, I, I, I thought I would go to college for writing, and then I didn't get into Yale. And so I, was, I, I lobbied to get into Carnegie Mellon, and they were like, you, you're missing a science credit, so you're going to have to take a science. <laughs> I said, I took the science credit in Denmark, but my oh. high school <laughs> didn't request it, and the Internet wasn't around back then. Right. So it was, I had to give up on Carnegie Mellon, and at the last minute, I lucked into uh, SUNY New Paltz. Which and turned did out to they be an have amazing a theater school. Department? Great theater department. Uh, John Turturro went there. Really? Um, I don't know if you remember Joan Chen. She yes, was an I, actress, yeah. she was a good friend oh, for great. a long time. She's yeah. been on this show. No way, that's crazy. She was crazy. like one of the first people no, years that's ago. that's too funny. She went there she too? She went there as well. So there was a nice lineage to follow. Oh, wow. So when you started writing, were you directing your own work? I was, actually. Good question. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I remember in college directing a, a couple plays and taking some directing classes and directing my own stuff because at the time I thought I was the only one who could really understand what I was going for. And what were you going for? Ha. These bizarre titles? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. they weren't all bizarre titles no. at that point, were at they? at that point, no. I mean, I've always been had a thing for titles. I've Little. always liked a good, quirky title. <laughs> Little quirky, right? Yeah, if the play has a, like, Siamese sexual, when I read that title, I thought, oh boy, I Somebody think I'm going to love that? this. Yeah. Somebody yeah. else wrote it. John Papa George wrote Siamese Sex Show. And that's what you're directing mm -hmm. now. And that's what's running currently at the Lounge Theater. So tell us a little bit about that since we're talking about it. We'll si jump all sure, around sure. today. Siamese Sex Show is a pretty wild ride. Uh, it's really fun. It's a, like a comic book on stage. Are they Siamese twins? There are no Siamese twins. It's actually, <laughs> <laughs> which may be a good thing. <laughs> or a different thing. <laughs> or just a different thing. <laughs> Basically, the title is one of those sort of like a, a hook to sort of draw you right. in. Um, but Siamese from Siam. From Siam. From it's Thai basically a reference Thai to yeah. Thailand right. and, um, oh. and how the, well, I don't really want to go into that whole element of the show necessarily, but the, there is, um, the play is about, the musical is about uh, an evil CEO who takes over the world, if you can imagine such a scenario. I know, that's a, <coughs> Trump. That's a change. <laughs> and uh, and he in, he invents a device that uh, will give people can I say orgasms on your show? I guess <laughs> I, guess I just did, <laughs> um, and uh, give them the best that they've ever had. And so it sort <laughs> that's of that's the sex show. That's the sex show. So oh, people wow. stop having uh, physical relations. With oh, each oh. other and just use the device, sort of as if an iPhone could give you whatever you need. Whatever you needed, and so he, he by using that he plans to take over the world, and he hires all these pop stars to promote it and to be the spokespeople for it, and then he turns the pop stars or has a plan to turn the pop stars into robots. And so they revolt, and they... So we have this whole... Just, we have everything, like you said, comic book in a way, yes, right? Yes, very comic Because book. you do everything. How do you direct something like that? Ah, you just dive in. It is... Because do you have robots madness. on stage? We have one sexy um, female <laughs> robot, uh, <laughs> Cherry. Do? Oh, wow. Cherry is one of, the, one of the most popular characters in the show. And... Uh, but how many characters do you have? I think it's... 13? Oh, you have a huge cast. It's a big cast. It's a big cast on a little stage, too. I know. That's a small stage. Yeah. Did you cast it? I did. I did. Michael Donovan was our casting oh, director. Oh, I love Michael. He's, he's, he's been on the gift. show, too. He's a gift. Isn't he's he the best? really exceptional. And this was a very hard show to cast. And how does he do that? You know, he's I mean, just he so connected. I mean, he has to talk to you, right? He does. He does. He, he and I chatted. He was like, tell me about this play. He's like, I don't know that I get it. Because right. it, was, it was really stylized. Right. It's a very unusual... Well, the, tell us about that. Um, the style of it? Yeah. I mean, I am directing it like it's a Beyonce concert, which so is sort like of this, bizarre. Like just sort of turn to the audience and sing your songs. 
And just, is it singing? It is. It is. Lots of singing. The oh. songs are the best thing about it. And did Papa, what's his John name? John Papa George. He wrote Papa the music. Papa George. Did he write the music mm -hmm. too? He, there's a few raps in the song and some hip hop music. Wow. It's pop music. It's not your typical theater music at all, at all. As a matter of fact, one of the directing visions was let's not do it like a musical theater. Let's do it like a concert. Let's do it like a, a hip hop concert. And had you produced musical theater before? Directed I, it? I had. Dire I have directed musical theater. I love to direct musical theater. It's. It's. Um. I like to direct the more unconventional pieces. But I'm not this your, is unconventional. Which this is very much. Had you done anything like this before? Sure. I directed a <laughs> Mulholland Christmas Carol. Oh, there you are. Which was another kind of funny thing. Mm -hmm, a story of L.A. history and right. how we got water here set to a Christmas Carol. So Mulholland was Scrooge. So you got your... I thought you were going to say Mahon was screwed. Oh, yeah, well, that too. <laughs> that too, right? <laughs> well, um, so, so what does the set look like? Oh, my goodness. David Offner did our set for Siamese Sex Show, and it's, um, it's, it's metal. It's a steel set. Oh. So there's ladders, and there's a stripper pole, and there's curtains. Like, so you feel like you're in the red light district in it Amsterdam. Sounds, yeah. It's really evocative, and, and he really helped me use this tiny amount of space because I have height. Oh, yeah, so you can go up, right? So it really just it just makes it much more spectacular and dynamic. And then when did you start doing voiceovers for cartoons? That's yeah. really interesting. That was really fortunate for me. I, I really, I, I'm not sure how I got to be so lucky. You know, connections in Hollywood, they always say, don't burn bridges. But your voice doesn't sound bizarre. Right, or, right. I don't know, have like a your terribly titles, quirky... Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought I had a really weird voice. It took me until I was in my maybe 30s to sort of get comfortable with my own voice. It doesn't sound weird. I, you know how your own voice sounds in your head. And <laughs> when I was a kid, I remember hearing myself on tape. On a, I was filmed as an actor when I was like five. Oh, and I was like, wow. that's not my voice. What did oh, they do? That's I not see, me. I don't I understand. See, I see. So, you know, after a while, I, I adjusted and, and, uh, and I got to be on uh, the new Scooby-Doo series. I know. That's so great. And what kind of voice do you use? Um, I play young, like uh, an 18-year-old. And so I sort of just raise my voice and talk enthusiastically and a lot of energy. And, and I got to solve the mystery. I even got to say Scooby-Dooby-Doo. Oh, that's <laughs> incredible. <laughs> Dream come true. I mean, really? you know, you grow up watching a show like that. And then all of a sudden, you're, you're on, it. on it, and you're I solving know. the mystery because Thelma told you to. Velma, I Velma. just called her Thelma. That's okay, Velma, Thelma. <laughs> What's your name, Kiff? Right. Where'd you get Kiff, by the way? Kiff is short for Christopher. Since I've never, I was, is it Kiff always been like that? Is you, that always a nickname for Christopher? You know, there's actually another actor in Hollywood named Kiff. He's got mm. a few more IMDb credits than he I does have. He does a little bit more, but, but he doesn't have as many commercials as you do. Maybe right not. I don't think so. What kind of commercials did you do? Let's see. Most recently, I did a Wellmark spot. Um, I did a, a, a Miller. Um, I do a lot of car commercials. What kind of person do you act like? I, in commercials, <laughs> I'm always doctors or um, young dads. I'm always oh. the guy in the car who's like, That's what I wonder. Oh, <laughs> don't run over your kid's backpack. <laughs> That's what I wondered if that was it. So before we leave, tell me a, a little bit about Medicare Mermaids. Medicare Mermaids is a bit That's of That's how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 can, I can relate. It's I, when um, I was approached by a friend of mine, uh, L.B. Zimmerman, who had written a short sketch to do as a late night play, and she said, you know what, this would be better as like a short film or maybe a web series. <laughs> Oh, it's so a web series. It's a web right. series, and so she and I got together, and we, uh, her, her, it was really, really long, and so we shortened it and turned it into three episodes, and then we added three more and oh, so shot them all in one day. It? You wrote it. She and I co-wrote it, uh -huh. and then I directed it. We shot it. All six episodes are online. There, we've gotten five hundred thousand views or something. Wait, I lost where, track. Where did you shoot it? We shot it in Hollywood. Uh, Did Hollywood you have a Studios. location? Oh, it was green screen. Green screen. Green screen. Oh, and see. we have got, hired some fabulous uh, um, green screen experts, and they dropped in a um, Brooklyn Beach backdrop. Oh, fa fabulous! It's because they're from Brooklyn. Old, and for old people, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. It's it's. I mean, it's a political satire. It's it's a pro Hillary Clinton uh, web series. Oh, it's, it is. It's mermaids for Hillary, basically. Oh, so is it, was it just done for the election? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was just, oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. And you've gotten that many hits. Yeah, it's crazy. And well, we, we didn't do anything about Trump because we didn't think he was going to make it this that far. Kind of thing? Oh, so, oh yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah. Okay, well, would you put us on that, too? Yeah, And absolutely. get as many... <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, yes, exactly. I'd be happy to. Thanks so much. Yeah, Jeff, what a real pleasure. Thank you and so don't much. go away. We'll be right back with performer Paul Link. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here at the Hollywood Museum in the historic Max Factor building, and I'm with... Writer, performer, director, Paul Link, who was born in New York and moved to California as a teenager. After graduating from Notre Dame High School, he earned a BA and Masters from USC. He co-founded the Powerhouse Theater in Santa Monica, where he created his solo show, Time Flies When You're Alive. And then he went on to be a producer, which went on to be produced by HBO and nominated for a Cable Ace Award, which was fantastic. Then he, he wrote Life After Time and the last of the three, Father Time. He's worked in L.A. at the Pacific Residence Theater and the Ruskin Group and in New York at the Lambs Theater. I don't know the Lambs Theater, but I know the Lambs Club. It's delicious food, the dinner there. And the Irish Rub. <laughs> so just to give you an idea of all the theaters he's been in, back and forth. But the most important theater that he's been in was at USC, and it was called the Stopgap Theater. So tell me about that, because I was there. <laughs> well, the Stopgap Theater is really where it all began for so many of us. It was the, a little brick small little theater on the edge of the campus and it was sort of a forgotten area when I was there in the late 60s. But, but I was there in the 50s, the late 50s, and we used to have go to theater there. I took Lighting 101 there yeah, with had, Bill, all, all, yeah, Will, Bill White. Bill White. <laughs> famous Bill White. Uh, was he the famous Bill White? Well, he was to me because when we went to Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Festival in 69 and 70, we had an improv group with John Ritter and this director guy, Jack Bender, who's gone on to direct Lost and a big-time director. Anyway, they were <laughs> yeah, both Jack. very, very good at improv. I mean, Ritter was world-class. So at the end of every performance of Megan Terry's Comings and Goings, we had an improv scene, and Bill White would always go, he'd look at all of us and go, let's see, who should I get for this last? Let's have John and... Jack, and we'd all sit there. Oh, like you know, that? Like, it was all, <laughs> always the same two people. He never like, picked you. No, we're always, we all paid to go to Edinburgh, you know, to I be know. part of the program. But uh, and, and the one thing I always learned was that you have to go a certain way. You always have to be in the right direction, yes, going the right yeah, way. Yeah. Traffic pattern, yes, he used to yeah, always say. Yeah. I don't know anything about lining, but I remember traffic pattern because it really helped in later life. As yeah. a housewife, it helped. <laughs> I never went any further, but that was fun, and it was great to hear you talk about that in your your one-person play. Yeah, it's my time, new show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we talked about being in. Well, new that was York. an important thing because there was a period of my life where I was completely lost. You At know, the stopgap time. In 1968, I had you know taken too many drugs. I'd gone to see the Doors live too many times. I'd, I'd you know chased too many women. And I was lost. I was in a hospital. And I, I had, oh, you were? Yeah, and I had just taken this, uh, I had taken an acting class because this beautiful angel said to oh, me, because right. I was going to drop out of school, and she said, have you ever thought about taking an acting class? And I never had, and I went, even though I grew up in the business. I mean, my dad was Rich, my dad was Richard O'Link. He passed away in June. He would have been 98 last Sunday. Uh, he, 99 last Sunday. Wow. He was Andy Griffith's partner and producer and manager. That's why almost you came 40 to years. L.A., right? That's why we came to California in 1960, because the Andy Griffith show was going on the air. Now you wouldn't move anyone across Just town based on a show going on the air, because the odds of it lasting were minute. But how many years did it last? The Andy Griffith show was number one for many, many, many. I think it was still number one when it was canceled. And your father was number one with it, right? He was, yeah. <laughs> Richard O'Link. You see his name at yes. the end of every episode. And Always. then they went on to do Matlock, and then they produced the right. Gomer Pyle show and Jim Neighbors' Variety Hour and all that. So even though I grew up in the business, I was never had any intention of being in it. And then I was at college, and I was lost. And this beautiful woman, Monday Dooley, said, have you ever thought about taking an acting class? And I did. And based on that, it just, when I talk to young people now, you know, the whole idea of, okay, Right now, your choices are limitless. Right. Every time you make a choice, you have less choices. And there was a critical moment where I could have gone either way. I mean, literally, I might have dropped out of school. Uh, who knows? But you were lucky. Very, and you've been very lucky. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. You really are. For all the I stuff mean, that's happened. You know, I mean, I've paid. I mean, I had a wife die of breast cancer early in life. And you've maybe, had a lot of things happen in your life. Right. 
but I love the way you've made things positive after they've happened. And um, let's let's just go on talking about that, okay. and then we can talk about your directing yeah. afterwards. But the name of the play right now at the Ruskin... It's called It's Time. It's Time. And and why does time play such an important role in the work that you've done before? Well, I my line is, there's nothing more moving than time. More moving, that's right. I, and I, and as there's a pun there, but there's also <laughs> truth in that, because to me, time stirs the emotion, because if you really think about time, it's the constant reminder of the fragility of this whole situation. I mean, we are here lightly. I mean, we get over, we get carried away with ourselves, and, you know, we think we're our bodies, and, you know, we, we think we're our cars, and people are, have crazy notions of things. About but, how important we yeah, are. Yeah, exactly, and the reality is, you know, we're here for an, an instant and I don't know, time is just for but, me. But the one thing that I thought was so great is after your play, which is a one-person play and in a very intimate theater, which is great, very moving, you thank the audience for giving their time. Well, that is important to me because I want them acknowledged. I mean, they are coming, getting out of their houses. They're mm -hmm. driving in their cars in a very difficult city to drive around in. They're coming they're choosing to spend an hour with me. Yeah, but it's so great at the Ruskin because there's lots of parking. It's fantastic. <laughs> and it is, it is easy to If you to haven't get been to. to the Ruskin Group Theater at the Santa Monica <laughs> Airport, it's a fantastic house. And for solo performance, I mean, they just did Raisin in the Sun there, which has a huge cast. Has, yeah, but and it's perfect. It's, it's, it's like a it's, pleasure. I love it. It's, so, so that was the good thing. But after you thank the people for, for time, I was thinking about it. You've become, and this is in your play as well, almost a bereavement specialist. I called you a specialist because you approach bereavement because you said you lost a wife and now your father just passed away. Even though he led a long life and productive life, it's still a loss and you're still grieving. And you, you talk about how to deal with grieving. I hate to go like no, no, a I downer mean, like this. I don't this. think grieving is a downer because really in a sense grieving, I volunteer, I do volunteer I work, I do grief support. Um, it's just a part of life, and as I talk about in the play, uh, when I was in kindergarten, a classmate of mine died, and for reasons that I never fully grokked, I'll use the hippie term here, <laughs> the reason I never fully grokked, Mrs. Berger, my kindergarten teacher, asked me to help explain right, yeah. our classmate's death to my class. Now, I'm five years old at the time, and I think back on it, I don't know what she saw in me that made her want to did that. But maybe she was the influence on you that went the rest of your life. Well, it seems like death has been a part of my life. I mean, I lost a wife at 37 to breast cancer. I lost my one of my very best friends, John Ritter, at oh, 54. I know. Dropped dead. I mean, his likeness is on the building across the street coming here. All I could think about was John and, you know, his days at Hollywood High and our days at SC together. Exactly, right. And and, I've and lost... his son was on the show oh, here, too. Oh, Jason or Jason, Tyler? Jason, yeah, Jason. Well, I was... Adorable Jason. Jason... All of our kids were born in the same years, oh, so they all grew up together. In fact, divine. they all spent Christmas Eve at our home. Oh. They're part of that community that I talk about. And that's part of your about. show. Yeah, because, <laughs> oh, it is. Oh, yeah. In Jason's fact, Jason great. is the boy I talk about who would be in class with my son Jasper oh. at Crossroads because Jason oh, was his Crossroads. best friend. Oh, anyway, Jason's darling. Anyway, he's been on, too. He wonderful was on. actor <laughs> and a wonderful, wonderful kid. The, the whole family, Carly Very and Tyler, they're just beautiful children. So, so you've been around it is what it is, and you know how to deal with it, and you talk, or, or you t show us how to deal with it. I think you have to come with your heart. You have to open. I try to lead with my heart, and I figure that if I do that, then people will recognize the truth in that. And, you know, it's never, as I say in the show, having experience with it and maybe be more familiar with the territory doesn't necessarily help. No, it doesn't. When it's because... somebody like it's very close to you because you constantly are surprised by how difficult it is to grief. Grief is tough. I know. And the other thing that you said, which is so true, you never know when it's going to come because you think, and, and, and I've always said you can't judge people by the way they're grieving because you don't know what's happening with no, them or how don't. they're grieving. Did you direct yourself in this? No, I, I was directed by Edward Edwards. Who's a, whom I met that day. Yeah, he's, he's a dear great. friend. He's a, a, a Juilliard student. He is, um, you know, he directed me and all my sons. 
and, oh. and when I did Joe Keller, and I just loved working with him, and we become dear friends. And we were actually working on a different show about death and dying. How's that for same, an upbeat same. topic? Here we are. Well, again. but it, it was that was called "It's About Time." Now oh. I know I'm splitting hairs here. <laughs> this show is not the death and dying show. This is "It's Time." This is the long sought. sought a bookend to Time Flies When You're Alive, because this completes the story. Oh, it does, okay. And my goal up the road is to merge them and create a Time Flies When You're Alive 2.0, which would be the, the, the epic, the saga, the, the story from... How long would that be? Well, I'd trim, I would trim both. To put them yeah, together? Yeah, it would still only be an hour and a half, but I like its time because it's an hour long. So, it's very good. how did he come Edward? into this? Has he... Yeah, Edward. Has he... Um, Directed those other plays? Who directed no. the other plays? Well, Mark Travis. Mark W. Travis. Oh, I love Mark Travis. Yeah. He's been on here, too. I well, love he, him. Well, he, he came to my wife's memorial in 86 at John Ritter's backyard, and I spoke, and he said to me afterwards, have you ever heard of Spalding Gray, and have you ever thought oh, about doing a one-man one show? He's the one who said that? Yeah. And I said, I've never met Spalding Gray. I don't know him, and oh. I've never thought about doing a one-person play, but I will think about it. And eventually, I met Spalding and got to know him. Oh, and we saw all of his work on Broadway in and, New York. It and was I saw fantastic. That, you know, when I saw Swimming to Cambodia in a the theater, oh. I went, I can do that. I won't do it the way he does it. No. I do it in my own way, but, yeah. you know, and I was... Oh, so that's, that's how it got started? That's, that's how it all got started. And then uh, Robert because Egan... Mark, Mark Travis, I always thought, was the director for solo shows. He knows how to put well, on a I was his one first person. one. I was his first one. He was. Oh, and then... And then, and then, and then Bronx Robert, Tale. And then Egan. Yeah, well, Robert Egan directed my second show, Life After Time. Charles Nelson Riley directed my third show, oh. uh, Father Time. Oh, so you had all different directors, actually. Yeah, and then actually. let's see, and then uh, I had a... Well, let's stop on, on uh, Riley, okay. because you directed him. I did, Charles Nelson Riley. That is, directing Charles Nelson Riley is the equivalent of flying a 747 <laughs> on acid in an absolute hurricane. I mean, he was just... And that was at the Irish Rep, right? We did it. Oh, we did it all over the country. The Irish oh, you rap. did it all over? Oh, yeah, over? we did it in San Francisco. Oh. We did it here at a couple places here. Oh. The Falcon. We did it at the, oh. at the Cannon. Oh, we I did, remember the Cannon, yeah. Yeah, that was a, fantastic. We did it at the Irish Rep. We did it at the Bushnell in uh, Hartford. Oh, I didn't realize. It was a long, oh, ten ongoing... Years of, ten years of my life with Charles. It was. Yeah, he was like such a dear friend to me. And, and, and there again, was another one. Well, I, I also mean, directed Ben Gazzara. I was going to say, yeah. Ben Gazzara, also in New York. But yes. did that go places, too? That went to, we went to, I heard Syracuse mentioned, we were in Syracuse. We were in Sag Harbor oh. at the Bay Street Theater, and we were also at the Lambs in, in Manhattan. Oh, so, so I wanted to bring that in because you've had different directors, but you've also directed uh, different yeah. artists yeah. as well. A lot of people have approached me about helping them do their one-person plays because of my experience in it, and I, I've actually helped many people uh, develop and direct their pieces to try to get it going. And then how did you, with, with uh, Charles Nelson Riley, did you help write it? I did. <laughs> I co-wrote it. I got co-writing credit. Oh, you did, so. What happened was years ago, I was being interviewed, as I am right now, I, I, for Channel 9, I was with Stephanie Edwards. Oh, yeah, Stephanie Edwards, of and course. We had, I had an hour with her. Wow. So we're talking. It was a great interview, and then it was over. I was in the lobby, and the security guard said, is there a Paul Link here? And I said, that's me. He goes, phone call. So I, he, I, <laughs> Picked up the I phone. pick up the phone. I go, this is Charles Nelson Riley. I want to meet the man who does one-man theater better than me. Oh, and I wow. Hey, I, I knew who he was. I didn't know anything about him. He you didn't know him before? I didn't know. I knew of him as his persona. But I, I didn't mean, know you about, hadn't met him. You weren't no, and I didn't know Julie Harris. I didn't know any of those. I didn't know he did 13 plays with Julie Harris, oh. with Miss Harris. He was working with me on my third show, Father Time, and I was on his boat rehearsing, mm. and he says to me, you know what? He starts telling me these stories about going to the White House with Julie Harris and about <coughs> just his life. And I went, your show, you're the one that should do a one-man show. Oh, that's how And started? he said to me that day on the boat, he says, I'll only do it if you direct it. Wow. So that was great. And yeah. then you took it all over for 10 years. Exactly. Thank you so much God for being with us God bless you. Thank you for today. having me. Thank I appreciate you. it. And thanks for watching.